Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jen Hicks. I'm the director of um, communications and outreach with Maine Woodland Owners. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have everybody here today on this up here in Maine. It's beautiful weather, but it the topics of invasive plants is important. And so I'm, I, I am glad to be able to be inside and hosting a presentation by our the one and only Nancy Olmsted uh, from the natural areas, uh, Maine Natural Areas Program. She is the biologist for the Invasive Plants Program. And she is the one to talk to if you have questions and you wanna know about the invasive plant situation here in Maine. Um, she has uh, very graciously given, given an hour of her time today um, to do an update presentation about the, the latest and greatest and in invasive plants. And also, um, I guess the, uh, the oldies as well, things that have been around and they continue to be issues for us. Um, and I know, I believe there are a few people who are attending today who, have, um, who are actively involved in invasive plant management. So that's exciting. And um, I know Nancy's very interested in hearing questions and having some conversations a discussion with folks here today. I would say that um, the best way to go so we can get, so Nancy can get through her presentation is if you need some clarification during her presentation, that's just fine. Go ahead and type questions in the chat feature or you can turn your um, video on. I will be keeping track of uh, everybody as she's doing her presentation. So I'll, I'll see if anybody's got their hand raised, turn on your video and raise your hand. Uh, I know we have someone who's on the phone. Um, if you do need clarification, whoever's on the phone, you can just just uh, jump in and just ask, you know, get uh, grab our attention so you can ask your question. For the more in-depth questions, go ahead and type in the message area or wait until the end. There'll be time for questions then um, for Nancy. So we will go until five o'clock today. And... Um, I think that is everything. So if, uh, and since this will be recorded, this video is gonna actually be on our website, um, hopefully within the next 24 hours. So if you know someone who would like to, who would like to been here, but could not make it, this will be available later. Or if there's things that you would like to review that you missed while you were here, it will be available for you. Nancy, I think that's everything. I'm gonna yep. hand it on over to you. Okay. And again, appreciate you being here. Um, and the floor is yours. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Jen, for the invitation. And thanks everyone for uh, coming inside or at least uh, getting close to your screen on this beautiful day. I'm gonna give you today some updates about invasive plants. Like Jen said, some of the new plants that are known uh, in Maine. Uh, point you to some resources for helping to identify and address invasive plants and talk about a couple of the new projects that we have going on here at the Maine Natural Areas Program. So um, as uh, Jen said, I work at the Maine Natural Areas Program. We are part of the Maine Department of Agriculture, Conservation and Forestry. And our mission is really to help conserve Maine's natural heritage. So uh, part of doing that is helping, to, uh, helping people deal with invasive plants, which are a threat to those uh, treasured natural habitats and features. So that's my role and I'm delighted to speak with you today. So I'm going to get right into it with some of the new invasive plants and not yet widespread invasive plants. I have a handful of these to cover uh, before uh, that as the first part of my presentation. So diving right into plant identification. First up, we have black swallowwort. So black swallowwort is a long lived vine that is herbaceous. So it dies back to the ground every year. Um, but regrows from the roots each year. So on the left-hand photo, uh, you are seeing just one season's growth of this very aggressive invasive vine. The leaves of black swallowwort, which you can see on the far right-hand photo, are, are kind of a leathery texture and they are opposite one another along the vine. So we talk about plants having leaves that are alternate, staggered along the vine or twig or opposite. And so this one is opposite. In the middle, you're seeing on the lower photograph, the flowers of black swallowwort, which are quite small. They're only about a quarter of an inch in diameter. So quite small flowers. Um, and these are pollinated by uh, some small insects. And when they are successfully pollinated, they form these pods, these long skinny pods that hang below the vines. 
This is in the milkweed group. And so it might remind you of a milkweed pod like you would see in a hay field um, or an old field. And when the pod ripens, it will uh, peel open and the little tiny seeds with the little white strings or hairs um, are dispersed by the wind. So unfortunately, they're very small seeds. It's easy for them to be tracked in equipment or baled up with hay and moved around. So this is a plant that's expanding in Maine. Um, it used to be more confined to the coastal area through the mid coast, and it is expanding its range in Maine. So one to be alert for, particularly if you have um, open habitats like hay fields, um, and it is not particularly shade tolerant. So it will go a little ways into the forest, um, but it's not um, able to get into a closed canopy situation without any disturbance and, and really cause a big problem. So that's black swallowwort. Um, and it has a sister species, pale swallowwort, which we don't have much of at all in Maine, but in some other New England states, um, the sister species is more dominant. So. That's a invasive vine. Next up, we have an invasive uh, wildflower, ornamental jewelweed. This is also known as Himalayan balsam. It is closely related to our native jewelweed or touch me not that has the small sort of um, yellow uh, orange flowers. And just like touch me not, um, when the pods of the ornamental jewelweed are ripe, and an animal or a human pushes up against them, the pods explode releasing the seeds. So this is a plant that uh, spreads in streamside areas by movement of water. Um, as you can see from the middle photograph, it really can form very dense stands. It's a tall plant, or at least it, it can be tall, I would say generally from three to five feet uh, with these um, pink flowers that are about an inch or an inch and a half um, from top to bottom. The leaves of the ornamental jewelweed are uh, opposite or whorled, meaning um, three or sometimes four at a single point. And they're very um, uh, toothy on the edges. You can see in this photograph, the sharp teeth along the edges of the leaves of the ornamental jewelweed. Uh, so this is an escaped um, uh, horticultural plant and um, unfortunately can form these really dense stands in, in uh, streamside areas. So that's where it's a major problem. Um, this is a plant that has been gaining um, uh, in, in Maine. It's got a real foothold in the mid coast area around Rockland and Rockport, those areas, and it's expanding. So again, one to keep a close eye out for, especially if you have any creeks or rivers on your property. Next up, we have, uh, we're back to vines. We have mile a minute vine, and this is not yet known in Maine. So we're hoping to keep this out of Maine with good uh, eyeballs into the natural world to be monitoring for it. This is a annual vine um, that has these sort of triangular leaves and very uh, unusual clusters of blue fruits that form at the tips of the uh, vines. The vines have barbs or very small thorns on them. And another unusual feature are the round um, ochrea, they're little leaf-like structures that occur at the base of the leaf stem where the leaf attaches to the vine. So that's quite distinctive, um, a very sort of uh, equilateral triangle shaped leaf and the funny little round, um, uh, they're really modified leaves, funny little modified leaves that are round where the leaf attaches to the stem and the uh, bright blue colored fruits. Uh, the far right hand picture is showing how aggressive this plant can be. Again, this is an annual plant, so it grows from seed every year. So this is just one year's growth, kind of sprawling on this um, planting and, and covering it up. So very aggressive growth with some hooked um, uh, little barbs along the stem. So we're trying to keep this one out of Maine. Um, and if you detect it, if you see it, we'd love to have you report it. Um, and I'll talk more about reporting in a little bit. Okay, next we have a grass. So this is stilt grass. Um, this unfortunately has been detected in Maine for the first time last year. So this is a shade tolerant grass that can invade the forest understory. So we're very concerned about this grass. On the left-hand photo, you'll see a close-up of the uh, grass and the leaves. 
This is uh, my hand in the picture for scale. So the leaves are between, generally between two and four inches long. They are alternate along the stem and they have a silvery midline or mid rib, it's sometimes called. And on the right-hand photo, the red circle is highlighting an example of the silvery midrib. That is a really uh, distinguishing character for this grass. We don't have any native grasses that have that silvery midrib. And also in the right-hand photo, you can see some reddish color on some of the stems. This is also a characteristic of this grass um, in the fall. Um, it starts to have a little bit of red coloration along the stems. Um, this is also an annual plant, so it grows from seed every year. It makes many, many tiny little seeds that can unfortunately easy, easily be tracked in the um, treads of your boots or in mud that might be on equipment like lawn mowing equipment or forest harvesting equipment or road building equipment um, or in the seeds, uh, in the, excuse me, in the soil that comes with potted plants. So. Um, this is stilt grass. I have some additional photographs of stilt grass on the next slide. These are showing one of the sites in Maine um, at a nursery, uh, and you can see that the infestation is quite significant. Um, this was not a, um, a brand new infestation by the time it was detected. It was quite extensive. So we're going to be working with the landowner to um, hopefully contain and eventually eradicate this infestation, but it will take many years. So. Um, if you see an aggressive grass that has that silvery midrib, um, that's a cause for um, further investigation. Um, another uh, characteristic that can help with this grass, because grasses are a little challenging, many of our native grasses, if you run your finger along the leaf edges, they will be rough. But silk grass is not rough along the leaf edges. So that's another um, little character for this grass. So if you think you have you know, silk grass, we definitely wanna hear about that. I would be happy to look at photographs. This is a late um, grass. It might just be sort of you know, getting going right now. Um, and as you can see on the, the photograph, this photograph from September 15th, um, it, it, it really sort of comes into seed later in the season. So um, that's something to know about this grass. Uh, next, we come to a tree, a full-on canopy-sized tree, tree of heaven. Um, this invasive plant has a very large compound leaf. So on the left side here, you're seeing um, the leaflets on the compound leaves. So compound leaf like an ash um, or a walnut or something like that um, uh, with many leaflets in a single leaf. And on the right-hand photo, you're seeing an example of the tall trees. Um, this is a, a full-on canopy-sized tree. And um, it, the female trees have these fruits, which look a little bit like the fruits of an elm. They're sort of a dry fruit with a little papery um, husk, uh, like a maple samara or an elm seed uh, in clusters like that. If you drive along 495 in Massachusetts at the right time of year, you'll see many of these uh, groups of Tree of Heaven with the clusters of seeds. They can be distinctive. I have another a set of photographs here of Tree of Heaven showing a close up of the base of the leaflets because um, the leaflets of Tree of Heaven have smooth edges except at the base where they have a couple of little bumps. Uh, you can see them sticking out from the leaf. And these have little glands on the underside of the leaf. And so that's a helpful character. Um, the leaflets of a commonly confused lookalike sumac are toothed regularly all along the leaflet. And so if you're looking at a, a, um, a sumac, it's definitely got teeth all along the leaflets as opposed to tree of heaven, which is smooth except for at the base. The bark of tree of heaven is said to look like the skin of a cantaloupe. And I think that's very descriptive. So I've, I've included a close up of the bark, which does uh, really look like a little bit like a cantaloupe. And then the twigs of Tree of Heaven, if you break a twig, it has a bad smell like a, like a peanut butter that's gone off or is a little rancid. So people who have worked with this tree um, can sometimes detect it you know, by the smell. Tree of Heaven can have some, um, uh, the, if you get the sap into your body through like cuts or sores or blisters, um, some people can have a reaction to it. So um, it's a good idea to, you know, cover up, you know, wear long sleeves and pants and use gloves if you have Tree of Heaven. But we don't have much Tree of Heaven in Maine. And we're actually looking for locations of Tree of Heaven. 
So if you think you have Tree of Heaven on your property or you know where one might be, um, please let us know and we will um, reach out to the landowner. Um, this is the host for a destructive invasive insect called spotted lanternfly. And we are uh, actively looking with Maine Forest Service and the US Forest Service for locations of Tree of Heaven um, to use, um, to understand more about um, the possibility for spotted lanternfly in Maine, which we, we don't have yet, um, but we're on the lookout. So those are some of the top sort of new um, and or, or expanding invasive plants that I wanted to alert you to. Next up, I'd like to cover some resources that are available for landowners and some new projects that we have going on at the Maine Natural Areas Program. I'll come back to plants, um, plant identification sort of toward the end where there, uh, I wanted to make sure that we covered the resources and new projects first. So one of the resources that I'm very proud of um, is our book called the Maine Invasive Plant Field Guide. So I've abbreviated it on the slide because it's kind of a long title, the Maine Invasive Plant Field Guide. And um, this is a field guide to 46 uh, invasive plants. And um, it's a great tool to bring you with you in the field. As you can see, it's kind of a portable size. It fits in a big, like a Carhartt pant pocket um, or a cargo pant pocket pocket. It's waterproof, so each of the pages is, um, it's like a plastic uh, quote unquote paper. And so it'll last for a long time. Uh, it's color coded, so it has different colors for invasive uh, herbaceous plants and grasses, shrubs, trees, vines, um, color coded pages on the bottom. And each page uh, shows you a, a photograph and tells you how to identify the plant and some lookalikes. And then on the back side, um, there are more photographs and it talks about how to control the plant. So this is a nice little resource and it has um, most all of the kind of common species in Maine as well as some of the new ones. Um, this is available for sale via Maine Woodland Owners or also via the website of the Maine Natural Areas Program. And um, we have, I've just listed on the screen some websites that complement this guide. Um, we do maintain a web gallery on the Maine Natural Areas Program website, which has a lot of the same information for the most common and some of the most important invasive plants. We also have the Maine Natural Areas Program advisory list, which has fact sheet links to all of the 100 and some plants on the advisory list. That's our non-regulatory list of invasive plants. And then I've provided also the link to Go Botany, which is a wonderful educational website um, that is all about uh, plants in New England. So this is put out by the Native Plant Trust, which was formerly called the New England Wildflower Society. And it tells, it shows you lots of photographs of each plant and goes into identification characters. So um, if you're looking at the field guide and you think, gee, I, I might have that one, but I wanna see some more photos, these are some places that you could look for additional photos. As you can imagine, to make this portable, we had to really um, you know, cautiously use photographs because we wanted to make sure that there was good text in there as well. Um, so that's a resource um, that's a great one if you're an active landowner um, or just someone who likes to walk in the woods um, and wants to know more about invasive plants. Another resource is a little um, trifold brochure. So this is just on regular size paper and um, this is kind of a basic introduction to invasive plants. You know, what are they? Why are they harmful? How did they get here? Why are they successful? And what can we do about them? And it has photographs of some of the most common invasive plants and goes over, you know, how to report things using our online mapping tool and um, uh, the list of plants that are on the do not sell list. So we do have a regulatory list of invasive plants. Um, that are no longer legal to grow for sale or sell in the state of Maine. And so that list is provided. Um, and this little brochure is available to download from our website as a, as a PDF, so you can easily print it. Um, you could use it to talk to a contractor like a logger about invasive plants or a neighbor or anybody in your family or friends, really. Um, so that's available for download for free. Next up, we also have our IMAP Invasives um, app. Um, so IMAP Invasives is our online mapping tool for invasive plants in Maine, and really any, it will accept um, any kind of invasive species. Um, this is uh, both used through a website, like a browser, um, but you also have the ability to use an app um, so that if you're standing in the woods and you have a smartphone, and you have an IMAP Invasives account, you can quickly and easily make a report of an invasive plant. 
So um, IMAP Invasive is free to use, but it does have an account-based system. So you, you use your email address and you sign up for an account. And um, we welcome any reports of invasive plants on public land, like um, state parks and state lands, um, Bureau of, uh, excuse me, Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife lands, town lands, any of those kind of public lands, and on private land with permission of the landowner. So the IMAP invasives data are public. And so we do ask that if you're on private property, you just get permission before reporting those data into IMAP invasives. But it's very simple to use and, um, there is a uh, handout that goes over how to use the app. And um, there's also a great website at imapinvasives.org. So all that you need to start reporting invasive plants in your local town forest or state park. Um, we welcome your uh, community scientist observations. Next, I wanna tell you a little bit about our new um, program in partnership with the Maine Forest Service. So. Uh, the Maine Forest Service, in partnership with my office, the Maine Natural Areas Program, has a brand new program called the Invasive Plant Management Program. And there's sort of three key parts to this. Um, number one is an invasive plant academy. So we just had our first academy. And at the academy, we're training foresters and other natural resource professionals to prepare invasive plant control plans. So um, these are folks who are out in the woods. They are already providing various services to clients. And one service that they can provide to clients is an invasive plant control plan. So the control plan includes um, maps of the invasive plants on the property, list of what plants are present and detailed management recommendations, including a timeline of suggested actions. So um, those cost money to prepare. And so we have funds to assist landowners to pay for those. So that's the number two, the cost share for the invasive plant control plants. So a landowner would hire one of these trained academy graduates to go out and the, the graduate of the academy would prepare the plan. The landowner would pay the plant, pay for the plan. And then the main forest service, um, it gets a reimbursement to the landowner for up to 50% of the cost of the plant. Everything has to be approved in advance. There's like an application process and everything, but um, we're hoping that this will be a great way for landowners to find out more about what are the potential problems on their on their wooded property. So this is for um, owners of woodlands uh, between 10 and um, 1000 acres in the state of Maine. Um, and uh, we're hoping to have a second round of landowner applications. So we had our first round of applicants and we got about 35 applications to get plans prepared. And um, we are looking into a second round um, that would be announced within the next couple of weeks. So stay tuned. Uh, we hope to have more information about that shortly. Excuse me, let me just take a sip of water. And then the third phase of the project is uh, to provide funding to implement the treatments. So um, that will be on a competitive basis. So we're gonna, for approved plans, um, landowners who have approved plans can submit an application to get treatments and the treatments would be provided at no cost um, through the Maine Forest Service. So we're still working out exactly how that's gonna work. Um, the Maine Forest Service, um, uh, we're, we're working with, we're talking with some contractors about the best way to handle that. But um, the good news is that, you know, we did receive this grant from the US Forest Service and we have a substantial amount of money. Um, it's, the grant was for $370,000. And most of that is set aside for the cost share for the plans and the um, treatment funding. So um, this is a new uh, resource that's available for landowners. Um, we know for sure that we'll have um, another round of the academy and the uh, application period for plans um, next year. And we're hoping to get additional funding to extend the program into the future. So if you are a, a woodland owner and you wanna learn more about this, um, all the details are at the website of the Maine Forest Service Invasive Plant Management Program. So um, I'm very excited about that. And uh, it's been a wonderful collaboration with our partners at the Maine Forest Service. Uh, oh, so I guess I have a little bit more detail. So um, I thought I, I forgot that I put these slides in. Uh, this is my second presentation of the day, so bear with me. Um, so yeah, so this is just explaining a bit more about the invasive plant control practice plans with an example of the kind of map that you might receive, uh, stating that the plans will be prepared by the Invasive Plant Academy graduates this summer and next summer, and that 50% of the cost is reimbursable up to certain maximums. 
and that there's a standard format and components for the plans and we might have another round of applications next year. So I said this um, verbally, but here's a nice example of the kind of, you know, one of the kinds of maps you might receive um, where you're seeing uh, denser areas of common buckthorn, one of our invasive plants highlighted in green, along with in isolated occurrences as little green dots on the screen. And you're seeing the blue uh, or purple blue track of where um, the uh, resource professional walked to gather this information. So that's an example of you know, one of the kinds of maps you might receive. And then here is a slide regarding the competitive treatment funding. So again, this will be competitive, um, but the awarded properties will have the management paid in full and the application process will be next winter. So for, plant, for properties that have an approved plan, they'll be able to apply. And this could include a variety of methods from mechanical to herbicide um, methods and, and other things too. And then there will be monitoring by Maine Forest Service of those treatments to see how effective they are and um, it, it give advice regarding follow-up. Okay, so now moving on to another new project. Um, this year, we have begun a review of the do not sell list of invasive plants. So I mentioned that we have a regulatory list of invasive plants in Maine and that comes up for review every five years. And so this was established in 2017, and it's a regulatory list maintained by the horticulture program. There is a stakeholder committee that oversees the list, and this is only for plants in the horticulture trade. So this includes terrestrial and wetland plants and plants that could hitchhike um, in plant material that's for sale. So um, those are the target species. And there's several steps that we're gonna be going through. We've already started the process. So number one was we drafted a list of potential plants to review based on the climate that we have here, other states lists and individual nominations. The committee um, has prioritized the list of plants to review. Uh, right now, uh, my, some of my staff and some of the um, horticulture program staff are reviewing the scientific literature to evaluate the plants against criteria that are established in, in rule. Um, the committee will be reviewing the results and providing feedback and making recommendations this fall. Then we'll have the proposed revised do not sell list. There will be a public comment period as part of the department rulemaking process where we will receive comments and respond. And I should say, this is all really overseen by the horticulture program by Gary Fish, who's our state horticulturalist. And then um, the horticulture program will get uh, review by our commissioner and um, finalize and publish the uh, revised do not sell list as part of departmental rulemaking. So it's a quite, a, quite of a formal process um, once we get into the rulemaking process itself. But right now we're in um, step three where uh, we are gathering scientific information to provide to the committee about each proposed plant. And we have a big list of about 80 plants that we are reviewing. So obviously not all of those will be listed, but uh, we are in progress with collecting information about all of them so that the committee can learn more. So that's a big project. Um, and I'm delighted I've got the very capable um, staff who are helping with that project. Another new project that we have going on this year is a survey for perennial pepperweed. So perennial pepperweed um, is a plant that is of top concern in salt marshes and beaches. This is only known from a handful of sites in Maine, um, but we wanna keep it that way. So biologists in Massachusetts spend a lot of resources trying to control this plant in salt marshes and beaches. Um, salt marshes are home to some rare birds, um, and so are beaches. And so this is very damaging for the habitat. As you can see in the photograph on the left, it can form very dense stands of almost nothing but pepperweed. And so it doesn't provide suitable habitat for our rare birds that nest in the salt marsh. Um, and same thing on beaches, it can form um, not quite so dense stands, but still it can displace the native plants that would normally occur there. So um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has funded the Maine Natural Areas Program uh, to hire a team that, to go out and survey for perennial pepperweed in Maine. And we'll be surveying around known locations as well as targeting the specific habitats that pepperweed is known to infest. So this is primarily in York County this year. Um, and if we get uh, additional funding, we might be able to expand the survey next year. So this is another new project that um, we're overseeing uh, this season. 
And on the right-hand photo, we're just showing a close-up of perennial pepper weed. So it's in the mustard family. It has a four-parted white, little tiny flowers. So um, that's my hand in the, in the photograph holding the stem. So you can see the flowers are very tiny, but when it's in bloom in July, it can be conspicuous and it, it's easier to detect. So the peak of the survey will be occurring um, for sort of the uh, July 1st through um, July 15th time period. So um, that's a new project that's going on this season. Not so much of a concern in woodlands, but I wanted to keep you up to date on uh, other invasive plant projects. So with the remaining time that we have, I'm just looking, it's 4.30. I wanted to cover invasive plants that are widespread in Maine and of top concern to the forest. So in addition to the, the new plants and um, expanding plants that I covered at the beginning of the talk, I want to turn now to the plants which are um, here and widespread and of top concern in the forest environment. Because obviously our audience today is very concerned about the health of the forest, as am I and as are most Mainers, because we have a lot of forest and it's a wonderful resource. So Asiatic bittersweet vine is a real problem for our forests. This is a tough woody vine that's long lived and it can strangle and girdle the trees. So in the middle photograph with the very thick vines, you're seeing how aggressive and, and large these vines can be. Um, these uh, vines can climb high into the trees. As you see on the right-hand side, those yellow leaves are um, Asiatic bittersweet in the fall. It turns that yellow color and it's easy to detect at that time, even when it's high up in a pine tree, because um, obviously the color stands out. It can also be detected when it's in fruit um, because it has very colorful fruit. So these are a, a, a sort of a dry reddish um, fruit with a yellow capsule that opens up. And so they are very colorful, um, but uh, they are bird dispersed. And unfortunately that means they can sort of hop around the landscape and come into the forest. Even a, a nice intact forest can become infested if birds carry the seeds into the forest. On the left-hand side, you're seeing a close-up of the leaves and some of the uh, unripe fruit. So um, the leaves of bittersweet can be sort of variable in shape. Sometimes they're long tapering and they have a pointed tip, like a couple of examples that you see here. Other times they're almost round in shape. So the leaf shape can be variable, but they always have teeth along the edges, sort of small, shallow teeth. <laughs> Excuse me, it's allergy time of year. So if you hear me sniffle, um, that's what's going on. And they are alternate along the stem. So Asiatic bittersweet has alternate leaves with teeth and um, the fruit of Asiatic bittersweet occur all along the vines. They do have separate male and female plants. So sometimes you might have a plant that you never see it fruit, even though it's a big vine and that one could be a male plant. So they still make little flowers that obviously have pollen that's released, but they don't form fruits because they're the male plant. It's kind of unusual in plants. Most of our plants have both male and female flowers on the same plant. Um, or in the same flower, but this one has separate plants. So that's Asiatic bittersweet, unfortunately very widespread in Maine and a real problem in the forest. Autumn olive is a shrub, and this one is not as um, shade tolerant as a bittersweet vine. Bittersweet can get growing underneath the canopy. Autumn olive prefers edges or full sun. So this one can get in along forest roads and trails, um, but it's less common to find it in the middle of the forest unless you've had a recent harvest. Autumn olive has alternate leaves along the twig and they have silvery scales on the surface of the leaves. So um, they almost have a silvery sheen to them. And um, uh, when I travel on 295 between Augusta and um, Bodenham, I can see a lot of autumn olive along the highway and I can detect them just because of the silvery sheen on the leaves. In a breeze, uh, they're sort of like waving to you like, hi, here I am, Nancy. Um, so that's autumn olive. They have a tubular four-parted flower and the flowers have now passed by here in central Maine and southern Maine. Um, up in uh, northern Maine, they might still be blooming, um, but they range in color from sort of a yellow cream color to white. Uh, if they're pollinated, they become this sort of reddish orange juicy fruit and the fruit is um, rich with uh, flavor and can be used to make jams and jellies and fruit leathers and stuff. But unfortunately, um, animals will disperse this fruit as well and spread the seeds that way. 
the photograph at the bottom right is showing sort of the open grown form of this shrub. So a shrub has many stems at the base as opposed to a tree, which is more like a single stem at the base. And this is the growth habit when it's growing out in the open, very open bushy shrub. It can be quite a tall shrub. There are some here on my office complex in Augusta that are maybe 15 or 20 feet tall. So this can grow very tall. Um, and there can be thorns on the twigs of autumn olive, sometimes like an inch long, very stout thorn. So this is autumn olive, one of our invasive shrubs. Next up, we have burning bush. So this is a landscaping shrub that was widely planted because it was it had very pretty color in the fall. And unfortunately, um, it spreads and is very shade tolerant and can invade the woods. So it has a small bird dispersed fruit. Um, so it can appear in the woods far from where it was planted. On the left, you're seeing the opposite leaves of burning bush with little teeth all along the leaves. And you're seeing how the leaves taper at both ends. The flowers of burning bush are pretty inconspicuous. You can see these little white green flowers here in the photograph. A very helpful defining character of burning bush are these corky wings along the twig. And that's why the plant is also known as wing duonymus. So these little wings that are along the twig are quite distinctive. Um, you'll find them on last year's growth. You won't find them on this year's brand new growth, but you'll see them on older uh, shrubs at the, at the base of the twigs and on last year's growth. And then I've included the photograph of the bright red fall foliage. Obviously the fall is a good time to detect burning bush in the woods because of the bright color. And again, this one is very shade tolerant um, and can really invade the woods. There's a bad infestation of this one at Bradbury Mountain State Park um, here in Augusta along the river and many other places. Okay, next I've got common buckthorn. So this is a shrub or a small tree that has um, leaves that resemble an apple, um, but the leaves of common buckthorn are uh, very uh, almost opposite on the twig. So botanists call it sub-opposite when they're almost opposite, but not quite perfectly opposite. However, this plant can really be um, variable. Sometimes it's opposite, sometimes it looks more alternate, sometimes it's sub-opposite. But if you look at many leaves, you'll see the overall pattern is sub-opposite. The leaves have little teeth all along the edges. And the veins on the leaves, they sort of curve back toward the middle of the leaf. And that helps me to identify this species. Um, the combination of the um, teeth on the edge of the leaves, the way that the leaf veins arc back toward the midrib, um, and the, um, the fruit when present are, are distinctive. And then the sub-opposite um, branching pattern. Those are all helpful characters. Despite the name, buckthorn doesn't really have thorns. It has a little tiny spine at the very tip of the twig. It's like a quarter inch or so, and it's very fragile. It's not gonna hurt you. Um, so buckthorn is kind of a funny common name. I'm not sure it, it might refer to a family of plants more than to really thorns. And the fruits are juicy and are dispersed by birds as well. This one is, uh, I would say moderately shade tolerant, um, not fully shade tolerant. And it likes sweeter soils. So I often find this around farms and places where the soil is, is good, uh, less commonly on more of our acidic soils. The uh, close cousin species to the common buckthorn is the glossy buckthorn. This is a very invasive plant that is a shrub or a small tree. And glossy buckthorn is not always glossy like this. So that's not the best character for identification. Um, things that help me with glossy buckthorn are um, that the, the glossy buckthorn is consistently alternate as opposed to opposite. The glossy buckthorn leaves do not have teeth. So many of our lookalikes have teeth like the common buckthorn and the apples and the cherries. Many of our lookalike shrubs have teeth on the leaf edges. The glossy buckthorn does not. And then the veins of the glossy buckthorn leaves are more straight, at least at the beginning. Um, they remind me at the beginning of an American beach with how regular they are. They're very regularly spaced and they um, go straight toward the edges until they get close to the edges and then they start to curve a little bit. So that combination of characters helps me find glossy buckthorn. 
Another thing that glossy buckthorn does, which is a little unusual, is that it has different colors of fruit on the same plant at the same time. So the fruits start off as green, saying, I'm not ripe, don't eat me yet. And then they go to red, I'm getting more ripe, but it's still not ripe. And then they turn black and that's when the fruit is fully ripe. And so it's sort of communicating to the birds and, and critters, please eat me now because I want my seeds to be dispersed. So um, it's kind of unusual to have this, this full range of green, red and black fruit on the same plant at the same point in time. So that can be helpful too. I put that uh, asterisk here because glossy buckthorn is starting to come into flower now. And so um, I said in, my, um, in the little blurb about my talk that I would highlight the plants that are conspicuous right now. And this is one that is starting to be conspicuous um, because it's coming into flower. Um, another uh, helpful character for glossy buckthorn, if you're pulling it up, you can see it's got a burgundy red root. I'm showing that in the top right corner. And so if you're not sure about it and you've got a small one, you can pull it up. And if you've got that burgundy red root, that is another helpful identification character that um, the cherries and the apples and such won't have. Great, so moving on to a, another, um, another shrub, Japanese barberry. So this one is a true shrub. It doesn't ever grow like a tree. Um, this is a understory um, shade tolerant plant and it was widely planted for landscaping. People would shape it with hedge trimmers and use it as a living fence because it's very spiny. There are spines all along the twig um, at the base of the little bunches of leaves. It has sort of small leaves about a, a, an inch or less long and they have they form in little clusters along the twig. It reminds me a little bit of a tamarack or a larch in the way that the leaves are sort of bundled. Um, and the, uh, the ornamental barberries can have a variety of color. So you can find some that are purplish, some that turn red in the fall, um, some that turn yellow. Um, the sort of wild type has, um, you know, green foliage throughout the growing season and you're seeing um, the lower right hand photo is showing how the barberry leafs out early in the spring. So in the understory of this um, deciduous forest, it's getting extra light in the spring. All those little photons, the sun rays that are coming down through the canopy when the trees don't have leaves. And that's giving the barberry sort of a leg up. So this is sort of a competitive advantage. And that allows it to produce a lot of fruit. So um, the fruit of the Japanese barberry hang below the twig on little, um, on little stems. And they look a little bit like a red Tic Tac, like those candies that come in little um, plastic jars that I used to love when I was a kid. Um, so they are bird dispersed or dispersed by chipmunks and mice and things like that. The thickets that are formed by Japanese barberry create a humid environment. And unfortunately that favors uh, ticks. So um, thickets of Japanese barberry, thickets of shrubby honeysuckle, thickets of multiflora rose are all known to be places where ticks are more abundant. And so obviously nobody wants more ticks on their property. So um, in addition to just wanting to manage these plants because of their ecological harm, um, another concern obviously is for human health. And so by reducing the number of thickets of um, invasive plants, uh, we can um, keep a healthier uh, forest environment. And uh, next I come to the knotweeds. Knotweeds are tall, um, tough perennial. Um, uh, they're not actually shrubs, they're, they're, they're herbaceous plants. So they die back to the ground every year. Um, but they're very tough. They have these very sort of um, tough stems. Some people call them bamboo. Um, true bamboos are grasses, so this is not a, a grass, but um, they do have a very sort of tough stem, even though they're technically an herbaceous plant. We have, a two, we have two different knotweeds in Maine, and these are conspicuous right now just because they're tall. So they've already reached the point where they're four or five or six feet tall. Um, so they're not yet in bloom, but they're conspicuous just for their, their height and the fact that they form these dense stands. So uh, it's not super important um, for the purpose of um, managing them to know which species you have, but just so you know, we have um, Japanese knotweed in the top right photograph with leaves that have sort of a flat base. Um, so the leaves taper to a point, but the base of Japanese knotweed is, is more or less flat, uh, straight across. Whereas in the bottom right photo, you're seeing an example of giant knotweed, which has a heart-shaped base on the leaf. And so the red circle there is showing the heart-shaped base of the giant knotweed leaves. 
The giant knotweed, like the name suggests, also has just a much bigger leaf overall. Um, it can be two to three so times the size of the Japanese knotweed and the plant is taller. So on the left-hand side, you're seeing a normal sort of Japanese knotweed stand. And then on the, in the middle photograph where I'm standing and waving, um, that is giant knotweed. So it's about twice my height. So very, um, very, very tall plant. We don't have a lot of giant knotweed in Maine and they do hybridize. So it becomes difficult to tell what's what. So um, for purposes of management, just uh, knowing that you have knotweed is sufficient. Multiflora rose is a species that's very conspicuous right now. This is probably the most conspicuous at this time of year because it's right in bloom and the flowers are very um, obvious and numerous on the plants. So multiflora rose is in a true rose. It has very sharp thorns that point backward down the stem and it has a compound leaf. So um, one leaf stem with many small leaflets. Uh, they're toothed on the leaflets and they have large clusters of many flowers. Each white flower is only about an inch in diameter, but they cluster together at the tips of the twigs. And so it has an overall effect of seeming much bigger. These are right in bloom along the highway right now and side roads. So as you're driving around the main landscape, um, and if you see a, a big um, shrub that has many, many white flowers right now, it could be multiflora. Um, it is a shrub, but sometimes I see it growing almost like a vine, um, sort of high up off the ground. It can kind of let, trail on other plants and kind of um, get up higher by doing that. It doesn't have any tendrils or sort of um, true vining parts, but it can occur quite high up, maybe 25 feet above the ground um, in some cases by sort of layering on top of tree branches or, or tall shrubs. Uh, the red circle at the lower left is uh, demonstrating a helpful identification character of multiflora rose, which is the fringed leaf stalk. So where the leaf attaches to the stem, there is a little comb-like fringe on that leaf stalk. And none of our native roses have that. So if you know that you've got a white flowered rose and it's got the fringed leaf stalk, that's a multiflora rose. And unfortunately, this was spread around because it was the grafting rootstock for many ornamental roses. And so um, maybe some of those um, rose uh, grafts were more fragile and died back, but then the roots, the, the multiflora rootstock persisted and became invasive. So that's why this is so widespread, unfortunately, in Maine and other places. And I should say multiflora rose is pretty shade tolerant. So I put this in the same group with the chubby honeysuckles and the glossy buckthorn and the Asiatic bittersweet. It can get right into the understory of the forest and be aggressive and, and grow um, big patches even in the forest understory in the shade. So coming to the shrubby honeysuckles, another one of our very common invasive plant species. Um, the shrubby honeysuckles have opposite leaves and the leaves tend to be hairy. So you can sometimes see it with the naked eye, how hairy the leaves are. We have a couple species of invasive shrub honeysuckles, but again, for ecological purposes, it doesn't really matter which is which. Um, you need flowers or fruits to tell them apart. Um, so we just call them shrubby honeysuckles. The flowers are irregular. They have these sort of leggy shapes with legs that point up and legs that point down. And they can vary in color from white to cream to yellow to pink. So um, typically you have plants that are either white cream or plants that are pink. Um, but these two species do hybridize as well. So you can have some unusual um, color variation. The fruits of the shrubby honeysuckles are usually paired. So they're in twos and they are typically red. Like I'm showing in this picture, I would say about 95% of the shrubs produce red fruit and some shrubs produce orange fruit. So I would say 5% or less. Okay, my lights are turning off. So I need to move around so that the lights will turn back on. We may or may not get the lights to turn back on. I'm kind of tethered with this headset, so bear with me. Um, but I'm almost finished. So I'll go to um, the pith, the hollow stem pith of the shrub honeysuckle, which I'm showing in the photograph on the right. If you cut your uh, twig of shrub honeysuckle with a sharp pair of snips um, on a twig that's you know at least as big around as your little finger, you should see a hollow uh, chamber. So it's not always gonna be quite as big as what I'm showing in this photograph, but always some kind of a hollow tube. And that is a helpful key because we do have some native honeysuckles and they do not have a hollow stem pith. So they have a solid pith and it tends to be white. Whereas um, 
mostly you'll see a, a brown center on the shrubby honeysuckles. I realize this one doesn't, it has a little bit of a brown center there, but it has a very hollow chamber. So shrubby honeysuckles have a hollow pith and they're very hairy. We have a native Canada honeysuckle and it does not have a hollow pith and the leaves are not hairy. Excuse me. So I couldn't speak with a group of Maine woodland owners without um, talking with you about best practices for getting equipment on your property. So something that's come up over and over as I've talked with landowners and foresters and loggers and with my colleagues at the Maine Forest Service Entomology Lab, the Insect and Disease Lab, is that invasive species spread on equipment. And so something that you as a landowner can do proactively um, when you have some kind of um, heavy equipment coming to your property is request in the contract that the equipment be cleaned before it arrives at your property. So, um, you know, for example, this feller buncher in the big picture, lots and lots of nooks and crannies on this equipment in the treads and in between the various parts of the machine where soil and plant material can get stuck, um, especially obviously if the ground is, is moist. Um, so there are just places where you, the equipment should be cleaned out when it finishes at the previous job site. And you can do that with a variety of equipment. It doesn't have to be fancy. So, you know, hand tools like shovels and um, hose, a leaf blower, um, and then, you know, getting more fancy as you go down here, um, compressed air, maybe even a pressure wash. If, if the if contractor knows that that site was badly infested with invasive plants, then that might be a time when a pressure wash is called for so that there isn't the transport of invasive plant seeds or plant fragments like knotweed roots that can reestablish and grow a, a patch. Um, this is also just a good practice and it's kind of like good housekeeping, like cleaning off your boat. You know, when you, when you move your boat from a lake to another lake, um, you know, you're required um, to clean your boat. And this uh, kind of a practice I, I hope will become standard operating procedures for when we move equipment around too, because unfortunately, um, you know, insects and um, diseases, fungal spores and little nematodes that cause beech leaf disease, we think, and um, hitchhiking insects um, like gypsy moth and um, brown tail moth, et cetera, can move around with the equipment. So I uh, just, as you, you as landowners can be proactive and request that your contractor clean the equipment. So I just wanted to put a plug in for that. And with that, I will um, show you um, my final slide here, which has my contact information and the logos of the various sponsoring agencies that helped me to do this work. And it looks like we have a five minutes or at least for questions. And I'm happy to stay on a bit longer if folks have more questions. So Jen, I'll look to you for yeah. guidance here. Thank you so much, Nancy. That was so thorough. And um, you know, it's kind of a go-to guide. We'll have this video up for a while so people can uh, have access to it so they can learn their plants. Um, just speaking on behalf of Maine Woodland Owners, um, one of our goals or our objectives as an organization is to help landowners feel empowered to keep you know, their, their forest healthy. One of them is knowing what plants you have in there, which ones are the good ones, which ones we have to keep an eye on. Um, Nancy's uh, point is catching things early so they don't spread, they don't get out of control. That's probably the best strategy is, is containment. Um, when you start seeing things, make sure they don't end up in uh, other parts of your forest. So I'll leave it at that. And um, this is, we have some time for some questions or comments. So again, you can turn your video on and raise your hand. You can just jump in and ask your question or you can type it into the chat. Who's got a question? While we're waiting to see if anyone has a question, thanks, Jen, for sharing a link to where you can purchase the field guide. Yeah, it's on our website. It's a great guide. Allison, yes, please. Uh, yes, thanks so much. This is really helpful. I am constantly going out and trying to manage invasives on our land, and this it's really helpful to have all the resources. Um, I think I have seen some stilt grass in our forest on the wood roads, just a few little bits. And it looked so strange that I started pulling it out and trying to get the roots. So I'm glad I did. Um, but I'm going to monitor for that. 
Um, yeah, I'd love to see photographs too, okay. because if it really is, I mean, there are some lookalikes, but if it really is silk grass, you know, we'd, we'd love to come and do a, do a survey because uh, hopefully it's one of our native grasses, but thank you I for looking. So, so yeah, I'll, please send when me I'm, some photos. Yeah. I'll, I'll, when I'm up there this summer, I'll look. I also wondered how um, I would find out about uh, professionals who will be who, who get the certification for the um, the in, through the academy who could do a plan? Yeah, so the list of um, approved professionals is now posted on the oh, website great. of the program. So if you do an internet search for Maine Forest Service Invasive Plant Management Program, it should be the first website that comes up and you go to that website and there's a little box on the right hand side um, that has like the landowner applications and the instructions and there you'll find the list of approved plan preparers. Great, thank you. You're very welcome. There's a question from Larry. I understand that knotweed can spread by water. Chopping it down, it will not down, it will root from pieces. pieces. Yeah, definitely. So the well, knotweed that's growing along banks of streams, the flooding waters can sort of channel out the, the roots and, and move them downstream. And um, the, the above ground parts, um, if they are moved, they can be rerouted and, and can grow from the above ground um, nodes. Um, so that is a concern. And, you know, we we don't want to control water. We can't really control water too much. So unfortunately, um, that one is out of our control, except in so far as we control the patches of knotweed. And it's it's absolutely true that um, chopping it down, it can root from pieces. But so if you're in an upland environment, if you're not near a dynamic um, stream, you know, if the patch is in dry area, if it's in your dooryard or right along, you know, at a dry landing or log landing. Um, you know, there, if there's not a danger that those pieces will be carried away, then you can just let them be. Um, if you're if you're using a strategy of repeated cutting, um, you can just let them lie in the patch. And even if they do, you know, reroute a little bit, you're, if you're going to be continually working that patch, it's unlikely that that's going to be a major issue. Um, you know, frankly, in that situation, it's more about just staying on top of the patch and, and continuing to cut it down. So I hope I understood that question um, correctly. Someone was mentioning um, some of the pesky diseases also that we're facing in the state. And I just, I'm gonna put a plug in. I just posted a link uh, for our pest and disease uh, program we're doing in Raymond on Tuesday um, at, a, at one of our land trust lands. How so, exciting to be doing programs in person again, right, I Jen? Know. That's wonderful, yes, how sure. great. Nice so we're to hitting, be able to touch and feel things. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to really hit on threats this, this month for sure. And um, I just, uh, yeah, so this will be, that's a good next step is to know what kind of diseases and pests we're facing in our force as well. Uh, there's a question from Larry. What about using brush be gone to control shrubs, et cetera? Yeah, so there are a variety of herbicides um, that are available for landowners to purchase to use on their own property. Um, the label is the law, so you just have to follow the label very carefully, both to ensure your own safety and also to make sure that you are using the product in the way that it's intended and, and in the way that it will have um, you know, the least uh, harm to the environment. So none of these products are benign, you know, they are designed to kill things. And so we just want to be really careful and make sure that we're following the label. But there are a variety of herbicides that are effective against invasive plants. Um, and, you know, if you ever have questions, um, the Board of Pesticide Control is a great resource. The main Board of Pesticides Control can help you understand the label if there's something on there that seems confusing or, um, you know, if, if uh, so we do have information on our website, for example, and in the invasive plant field guide about, um, you know, what uh, herbicide active ingredients are known to be effective on the different species. Um, so that's a resource to help you choose a product, but then, you know, what concentration to use, um, the specifics of what sites are okay to use the compound, all of that information will be on the label of the product and you just have to read that very carefully. Um, I keep all my labels in a binder and they're all highlighted and, you know, you really um, just want to be extra careful when you're using those products to make sure that you're using them correctly. We have someone on the phone and I wanted to give you a chance to jump in if you would like to say something, ask a question. 
No, I'm all set over here. Okay. I just uh, Thank you. I just took it off mute. Yep, yeah. I just wanted to give you a chance oh, to no jump purpose. In. Yep. Okay. Um, anybody else? Well, I I think uh, we got a lot out of this. Um, Nancy, it, you um, have your email posted on that screen and a phone number, so that's a good way of being in touch. And also the what's ailing my tree or uh, invasive and invasive plant um, forms are on the um, main forest service um, website and all the other websites that um, Nancy has talked about. So um, the eyes and ears of woodland owners is vital for the main forest service and natural areas program. And so if you find something that's qu with question marks, please send them along to the right folks. So hopefully that's something everybody can do. All right, well, I appreciate everybody's time today. Thanks yeah. for joining us. Uh, again, Tuesday, we have our in-person program in Raymond, and then um, we won't be doing another uh, uh, video online program in July. We will probably resume in August. So check your newsletter and our website. And I hope you can join us for our in-person events in July. Um, they're coming up, it's gonna be pretty great. So thanks everyone for your support. Thanks everyone. And being part of Maine Woodland Owners Thank program you. and we'll hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thanks, so Nancy. Take care, everyone. Thanks All for right. your thanks for your attention to your lands. Thank Bye. you so much. Thank you.